Okay, open with me in your Bibles to uh, Matthew 23, and we're going to look at verses 11 through 22, looking at the second part of true or false religion. Now, this, this second study here, looking at this particular issue of what is true and false religion. And remember, the word religion means worship or worshiper. So we're at looking at this issue of who is a true or a false worshiper according to the definition that Jesus gives here in Matthew 23. Now you remember, Jesus is warning his disciples about this issue because he doesn't want any of them to ever become like the Pharisees. He believes that these men are really just uh, playing a game with the Word of God and with the truths of God, and they are not living the, the life that God intended. And so he warns them here. Now, just to recap, verses 1 through 10. We saw there where Jesus said that false religion, the false religion of the Pharisees, was because they didn't do what they told others to do. Verses 2 and 3. And then verse 5, he said the Pharisees like to control people, but they refuse to help any of anyone. In verses 6 through 10, he says the Pharisees sought position and honor from people. And he said these were three characteristics that that really describe what false religion was all about. So, in our study today, let's look at some further characteristics of false religion so we won't ever go there. I don't want to be a Pharisee, and I don't think you want to be a Pharisee. And so it is essential that we understand these truths, and let God apply them in our own lives. So, in verses 11 and 12, Jesus said, But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whoever exalts himself will be abased, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So here, Jesus is declaring that false religion is revealed by individuals who are not willing to become servants. Now, the Lord saves you first that you might come to know Him and enjoy Him, to enjoy that fellowship with Him. That is the number one reason why God saves anyone. But secondly, after you come into that fellowship with Him, He wants you to become a servant. That is his primary desire, because he wants you to become like him. He was a servant. He took upon himself that form of a servant, Paul said in Philippians 2. And he wants you to follow in his footsteps. Now, the greater you know him, the more of a servant you should become. And that is clearly taught by Jesus throughout his ministry. Let me just read to you a few places, a few passages where Jesus teaches this. In Mark 9, 35, he said, If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. So he clearly wants us to be a servant in every respect and in all our relationships. In Mark 10, verses 42 and 43, he called the the disciples to himself and he said, You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great shall be Uh, among you shall be your servant. So, again, he's telling the disciples, look, if you want to be like me, then you're going to become a servant. If you want to be like the people in the world, then you're going to lord over other individuals. Then again in Luke 22, verse 27, he says, For who is greater, he who sits at the table 
or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as the one who serves. Now Jesus is saying this at that last supper where he has just served them. He has washed their feet and he's asking them this question. Who is greater, the one who sits or the one who serves? Well, obviously it's the one who sits. But he took him upon himself the form of a servant. Now, Jesus, in our text here in Matthew 23, verses 11 and 12, he couples together servanthood and humility. Now, this is very important because Jesus does that throughout his ministry. He couples these two issues together. They must go together. Without true service, there is no true humility. To Refuse to serve, literally, is to exalt yourself. And so, notice here, he couples these two issues together, as he does in Matthew 18, 1 through 4. It says, as At that time the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So notice here, Jesus speaks about this issue of them becoming greatest in the kingdom. You've got to become a servant. But that is... a re comes about by being converted. And then he says, whoever humbles himself as this little child. So again, notice, he's coupling together the position that you take with humility. But it all comes about by conversion, being converted. Now this, I believe, is what every one of us needs to understand. As believers, we need to have true, a true conversion experience. And this is what I don't think has taken place in many that are in the professed church today. They have not been converted. They've not been transformed from within. They just attend church and they think that that is what makes them a Christian. But conversion, repentance, and faith and turning around and going the opposite direction of the world is what true conversion is all about. And so, ministry, serving others. Now, where do you serve? Where should you serve? Well, service should first start at home. It should first be with those that you live with, the people that you are the closest with, your family. That is where God wants you to become a servant because the person you are behind closed doors is the person you really are. Not the person you are here at church, but the person you are when no one is watching. And so, how do you serve at home? Whom do you serve at home? And then, I think you would serve obviously at church. You would serve at work. You would serve others wherever you go. You should take upon yourself the ministry of a servant. That is your calling as a believer, as we've clearly seen. It will re require you to give in the smallest way to the greatest. The smallest way that you might give or serve is declared by Jesus. It says in Matthew 10, 42. He said, Whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, assuredly, I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. So, it could mean as simple a thing as just giving a cup of cold water to someone. And that would include your own children within your own home, just being a servant, helping. Now, for those of you that are deacons here in this church, elders in this church, board members, Sunday school teachers, ushers, greeters, you should see every opportunity of service, any place of service that you have taken upon yourself 
as, a, as an opportunity to serve others in a greater way. And you will do so because you love other people. So I believe that connecting humility and service is important, but the scripture also connects love and service together. In Galatians 5.13, there Paul said, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. So Paul connects love as a means of service to others. And so if you truly love someone, you will serve them. If you truly have a humility before God, you will serve others. Or you will look for people to serve you. So which is it? Are you looking for people to serve you or are you looking to serve them? Are you becoming more of a servant? Do you see that process taking place in your Christian life? I believe that that is essential. Every one of us, this is a proof of true discipleship. Now, going on to this next principle that Jesus teaches here in verses 13 through 15. Jesus declares here that false religion, the false religion of the Pharisees, was because of their lack of sincerity. It was revealed by their lack of sincerity. Let's read this passage. Verse 13. He says, But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense, make long prayers. And there's the key principle of this, this part of the text. Therefore, you will receive greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte. And when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Woe. Well, I'll tell you, Jesus is not uh, cutting these guys any slack. He is laying it on them. Now, false religion is clearly identified and revealed by the lack of sincerity in a person's life. They live a life of pretense. And that is what Jesus declares here in verse 14. For pretense, you make long prayers. Now, this word pretense is a, is a Greek word that literally means for show or a cloak to disguise. And this is why Jesus called the Pharisees hypocrites, because they were not sincere. They just did everything for a show so that somebody might see them. So, do you consider who's going to see you do what you're doing before you do it? If you do, that's pretense. You're doing it just for the external show so that somebody might see you and think, oh, he is such a spiritual guy. Look at that. This is why Jesus always taught the disciples whatever he said, go and do your almsgiving, do your uh, uh, helping and serving others. He said, do it in secret. Don't make a big fanfare and make sure everybody knows that you're doing this don't even don't tell anybody that you're doing it just do it do it because you're doing it as unto the Lord in Philippians 1:10, Paul prayed for the Philippian church that they may approve the things that are excellent he said that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ You see, when you're sincere, then you don't offend people. And when you are seeking to be sincere, people know it. They can sense it. They can see sincerity and insincerity very easily. I bet every single one of you in this room, you know people that you have had relationship with, and you can see the insincerity in what they're saying or what they're doing. 
And so the question is, is do you know that people can see your insincerity as well? They can see right through us. Now, long prayers made to show how spiritual someone is is one of the ways that Jesus identified this pretense or this lack of sincerity. Now, I'm telling you, prayer is one way that you can still see this today. There are some people that they want you to know how spiritual they are, so they will pray long prayers, and you think to yourself, when are they ever going to stop? Or sometimes people pray and they preach when they pray. I remember going to a pastor's conf uh, conference and a retreat one time, and I got into a group of pastors, and this one guy, he was praying for 15 minutes, preaching a sermon to us. And I thought to myself, my goodness, I, I can't stand this. I mean, he wasn't talking to God, he was talking to us, and he was preaching to us. God doesn't need to hear my understanding of all of the Word of God. He needs to hear my heart. He needs to hear the sincerity of my heart. And that can be in the shortest prayer. It doesn't take a lot of words to get your heart across. So be very, very careful. Paul felt that this aspect of sincerity was really the foundation of his ministry. In 2 Corinthians 1.12, he said, We have conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity. And he said he did this by the grace of God. So if Paul thought that godly sincerity was the key to his ministry, then I think we need to consider sincerity as essential to our Christian life and our walk with him. So are you sincere when you minister and you serve others or when you speak to others to try and help them? Or are you just doing it because that's what you're supposed to do? Well, I'm just going to serve because I, I said I was going to do it, but I don't sincerely really want to do this. It's not the joy and the love of my heart. That is a question that is so important. God knows our hearts and he knows the difference when we are being sincere and when we are not being sincere. Here is an example in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 33, verse 31. This is God telling Ezekiel not to be fooled by the people who are coming to sit in front of him. He said there, so they come. This is referring to the people that are coming before Ezekiel. They come to you as people do. They sit before you as my people. And they hear your words, but they do not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their hearts pursue their own gain. Now this is very much like what Jesus said. They, with their mouth they worship me, but their hearts are far from me. And so do I say things with my lips that is not really in my heart? That's the question. That's the difference between being, having true worship, being a, a true believer, and not being a true believer and a true Christian. And the more you allow yourself to be insincere about issues, the more you will become like a Pharisee. And that is why Jesus is addressing this issue. Now, you remember, in the scripture, even Peter and Barnabas were caught by hypocrisy. Remember in Galatians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. There, referring to Peter, Paul said, For before certain men came from James, he, referring to Peter, would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite. Interesting. Same term that Jesus uses for the Pharisees. They played the hypocrite with him so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. So this particular example makes it very clear that if Peter and Barnabas can do something in pretense, 
be hypocritical. Any one of us in this room can be caught in hypocrisy. So the question is, is when you say something, when you're making some particular profession, is that really a part of your heart? Is that really where you are at? Is that the honest part of your life? And are you expressing that sincerely? That's the question. And we need to constantly observe our own heart and be careful because we can fall into it. Insincerity is obvious to other people. And this is the charge that's always laid against the church and Christians within the church. Oh, there's so many hypocrites, you know. And why is that? Because we as believers have said something and made promises and then we don't fulfill them. That's the first point that we went over here in chapter 23. The Pharisees said, but they didn't do what they told other people to do. And so this is essential, that we are so careful about this issue because it will stumble people. It's the central reason why people are stumbled when they look at other believers. This is why Jesus said here, you are not going to go into the kingdom because you're a phony. He's telling these Pharisees, you're a bunch of phonies. You're not going to enter in. And he's saying, you know what? You don't want other people to enter in because, you know, you're, the, you're a phony and you're producing other phonies because people observe your life and they will then follow it. So this is a serious issue. It's so serious that Jesus said here, at the end of verse 14, he said, you will receive greater condemnation or greater judgment. Now, how can there be greater judgment? Well, greater judgment comes because this is a greater sin. Now, I know many of you have probably heard people say, well, you know, sin, sin, there isn't one sin that's worse than another sin. But that is not a biblical concept. Jesus said in John 19, 11, when he was speaking to Pilate, he said there, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. So, Jesus is making it clear that there is a greater sin. Why? Because the people who delivered Jesus to Pilate were who? the Pharisees. They knew better. They knew the law of God. They knew they were bearing false witness against him. They knew they had envy in their heart against him. They knew they hated him. And they did it anyway. And so he said, to them you will receive greater condemnation. In James 3, 1, it says, my brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. So for anybody that is teaching, this is a sobering thought. There is a stricter judgment based upon someone's knowledge of the Word of God. So the more somebody knows, the more God holds them accountable for what they know. To whom much is given, Jesus said, much is required. So there is a greater judgment. Now, some people say, well, how can this be? I mean, hell can only be so bad, Steve. I mean, how could there be a greater judgment? Well, all I know is Jesus said there was a greater judgment. I don't know how it could be worse, but it is worse because he said so. So I'm going to take his word for it. And I am not going to test him on this fact because I don't want to know the greater judgment. So, and I hope you don't either. So God wants sincerity. That's the bottom line. So where do you get it? How do you get a heart that's sincere? Well, the scripture gives us that insight. It all begins with sincere faith. In 1 Timothy 1.5, here Paul said, for the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart and from a good conscience and from sincere faith. Now work this backward up this passage. 
sincere faith. You see, real sincere faith, honest faith, true faith in him is going to produce someone who is going to obey their conscience. What they know is right, they're going to do it, which is going to give them a purity of heart, which is going to produce love. And it's all a result of hearing God's command. It's the, this word, uh, the purpose of the commandment. The word purpose is literally the Greek word for goal. The goal of God's commandment is to draw you into a love relationship with him. But it all begins with sincere faith. Sincere faith brings a right conscience, a sincere conscience, a sincere heart, which produces real love. And that's, that's where I want to walk. That's where I want to live on a daily basis. In Romans 12.9, it says, let love be without hypocrisy. That's the key. Let love, let it be real love, not phony love, not words without action, but or words without sincerity in the heart. We need that sincerity. So do you do things just for a show? Then you're becoming a Pharisee. Or do you do things because you sincerely love others and you sense that sincerity inside? Well, that means you're becoming a disciple. The more you sincerely walk and take action upon what you believe, the more you will become his disciple. Now, third and last here, the Pharisees revealed their false religion by their excuses and their rationales of why they were not obeying God. This is in verses 16 through 22. This is a difficult passage because many people read this and they just go, what is he talking about? So hopefully we'll be able to simplify this. Verse 16, he says, Woe to you, blind guides, who say, Whoever swears by the temple, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gold of the temple... Well, he's obliged to perform it. He said, fools and blind. For which is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold? And whoever swears by the altar. This, again, is another statement that the Pharisees made. If you swear by the altar, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gift that is on it, he is obliged to perform it. Well, Jesus said, again, that these men making this these statements were fools and blind. For which is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift? Therefore he who swears by the altar swears by it and by all things on it. He who swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits on it. Now, Jesus here is declaring one of the ways that the Pharisees, in very practical terms, revealed their pretense, revealed their insincerity, revealed their false worship, that they were false professors of faith in God. Pretense always equals excuses and rationales for disobedience. In fact, this is probably the way you can identify pretense is I'm a good excuser. I excuse easily. I have rationales for why I couldn't do what I said I was going to do or why I will not or have not obeyed the Word of God. These are basically just word games. Their excuses are just word games. They're, you're just playing with what you've said. And that's what these guys were doing. The Pharisees taught that there were binding oaths and non-binding oaths. And Jesus is saying, that's ridiculous. If you speak an oath, you make a promise, he said, then that promise needs to be kept. No matter by what or who you make this oath. And so... He's de declaring to them here that they were basically fools. They were blind for advocating this foolishness. 
Now notice the key, I think, to this is in verse uh, 22. He says, He who swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits on it. So all oaths are by him. That's the key to understanding this passage. Notice again in verse 21, he says the same thing. He who swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. So whenever I make a promise, it is by him. Doesn't make any difference whether it's by, you know, the, I'm swearing by the altar or by the gift on the altar by the gold on the temple or by the temple itself. I mean, these things are just ridiculous. They don't make any, there's no rationale or reason why one promise would be uh, binding and why one would not be binding. So what keeps a person from making excuses and rationales? Well, they have to be sincere. You see, there's there's a point, there's a, a progression here that Jesus is addressing. If you want to keep yourself from being a hypocrite, you've got to be sincere. And when you make a promise or you swear an oath before God, you say, Lord, I, this is what I'm going to do. I am going to serve you. Then you need to do it. You need to keep your promise. And that's all an oath is. It's a promise that you are making a vow of uh, and declaration that you are going to take some particular action. So whenever you promise someone anything, you need to keep your word. So are you a man of your word, a woman of your word, or not? Do people trust in what you say? Or do you just come back and say, oh, well, uh, this is the reason why I couldn't do that. And we come up with some excuse, some rationale. That is not being sincere. Now, the way you keep yourself from hypocrisy is, is a very simple thing. This is the way Jesus taught his disciples to keep themselves from this error. He said, just first examine yourself. Examine your own heart. And not, don't excuse yourself. Examine yourself. He says in Matthew 7, 5, he said, Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So when Jesus said, first, do this, he means this is first. So if you want to keep your heart in a right place, then first examine yourself. Don't look at other people. Look at yourself. What am I failing to do? What have I promised to do? Why did I not do this? And then make it good. If it's not just an excuse, a good rationale you never intended to do anyway, then turn around because there may be some circumstance that's happened that is beyond your ability. And if that is the case, go make your promise good. Be a man, be a woman of your word. Now notice also here Jesus uses this word blind five times in this 23rd chapter. He calls them blind. Now can that really happen to someone? Well, Jesus looked and spoke to the church of Laodicea and he said to that church, he said, you're blind. Revelation 3.17, there Jesus said to this church, he said that you are, you're poor, you're, you think you're rich, you're, you're increased with goods, you have need of nothing. And he said, you do not realize that you are wretched, miserable, poor, and blind. Now, if the church of Laodicea can be blind, then any church can turn to blindness. They turn to blindness simply because of their attitude. I don't, I don't need God. I can just do my religious duties without really having real fellowship with Him. And that is why Jesus called to them to come unto Him. He said, I'm standing at, at the door and knocking. He said, if you will open your heart and allow me to come in, He said, we'll have relationship. We'll have fellowship together. 
Now, excuses and rationales are just a part of the nature and the sin nature of man. And they all, it all began in the garden. That's where the first rationales and excuses were given. You remember that is, of course, where Adam and Eve gave their excuses for their sin. They said, well, you know, I, Lord, I wouldn't have done this, you know, except that's the woman you gave me. So he excused, Adam excused himself by pointing the finger at his wife and at God all in one sentence. And then she turned around and said, oh, Lord, it's the devil. He made me do it. The serpent deceived me. And so they did not take responsibility for their disobedience, but they made an excuse and a rationale when they should have been making confession and repentance. Very important example. In Exodus 4.10, there we see where Moses gave an excuse to the Lord. He says, Oh, my Lord, I'm not eloquent, neither before or since. You have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue, giving excuses to God why he can't serve him. And the Lord turns right around here and he says, Moses, you go. You do what I told you to do, and I will be with your mouth, and I will teach you what? you shall say. Jeremiah, he gave an excuse. He said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. This is Jeremiah 1.6. He's declaring, I'm too young. I don't know enough. And the Lord told him, You go, and I will anoint you. I will bless you. So don't give the Lord excuses. Don't give him good rationales because if he calls you, if he asks of you, then he will enable you. He will empower you. He will give you the grace that you need. Now, I find that many times I, I hear, I think I've heard every excuse there is. I've probably used many of them myself. But in counseling, I hear excuses all the time. People say to me, well, gosh, Steve, if, if they hadn't have done this, then I would never have responded. I would have never taken that action. Well, that just sounds like Adam and Eve to me. I need to say, I was wrong. I shouldn't have done that. Even though they had wrong action, I still have to take responsibility for my action. Sometimes people say, well, uh, I get angry because... See, Steve, I, I'm Irish or I'm Italian. I had one lady even say, well, I, I get angry because I, I got red hair. And I went, come on. I go, this is not a reason why you can excuse your anger problems. It's not because of the color of your hair or the nationality of your birth. It is a part of your sin nature. And you need to take responsibility for that. Or people say, well... You know, God will forgive me, so I'm just going to sin anyway. Have you ever done that one? Or sometimes people say, well, this is just a little lie. It's a little dishonesty. Or it's just a little swear word. It doesn't make that big a deal. It's not that big a deal, Steve. That's just a rationale and excuse for why I am not allowing the Lord to deal and change my life. He wants to purify your lives. And if you allow him to do that, you will become a disciple of Christ. If you reject his purifying work in your life, you will become a religious Pharisee. You will become a hypocrite. So if you're good at excusing yourself and rationalizing, you're becoming a Pharisee. If you're good at, at you know, making promises and very insincerely and not keeping them, then you're becoming a Pharisee. If you refuse to serve, you are becoming a Pharisee. And so I encourage you today, consider these principles. You do not want to become like these men. And yet that is a real potential for any professed believer. This is in the scripture for a reason. 
this warning and these examples are here for a reason. God doesn't want you to become a Pharisee. He wants you to become a disciple. He wants you to follow him, to be like him. And so I encourage you today, don't let this message just go in one ear and out the other. Let the Lord change you from the inside out. Let him bring conversion into your life. Let him bring humility into your life so that you will serve and serve in sincerity. And when you fail, don't make an excuse for it. Don't rationalize it. Ask the Lord to change you, to forgive you, and to empower you to live another way. Amen? Let's go to him in prayer.